In the headlines, President Park Geun-hye names Korea's spy chief as her new chief of staff as part of the latest reshuffle to start anew. Tech industry insiders and enthusiasts from around the world will soon gather in Barcelona for this year's Mobile World Congress, which kicks off on Monday. We'll check out what to expect from Korean players, Samsung and LG. A domestic shooting leaves four dead, including the gunman himself, just two days after a similar shooting incident. Is Korea getting angrier? We analyze. Happy Friday, everyone. Welcome to the show. Live from Seoul, I am Kang Tae-ri. We begin with news from the presidential office of Changwade. President Park Geun-hye has named the head of Korea's National Intelligence Service as a new chief of staff. She also replaced her senior press secretary and appointed four additional advisors. Choi Yoo-san has the details. President Park's chief of staff, Kim Gi-chun, had been widely expected to step down to take responsibility for the discord within the presidential office that followed a controversial document leak. On Friday, the president went against media speculation about Kim's successor and named National Intelligence Service Director Lee Byung-gi as her new chief of staff. E, a career diplomat, has been President Park's political advisor since 2007 and served as the Korean ambassador to Japan. Political watchers say appointing a confidant reflects President Park's determination to transform her leadership style and to better coordinate policies with the ruling party. While the ruling party welcomed the news, its floor leader, known for speaking his mind, joined the opposition party in raising concerns about the president appointing confidants in her administration. Meanwhile, the spy agency's former deputy director, Lee Byung-ho, has been nominated to succeed the new chief of staff. In a likely attempt to improve communication with the public, President Bak also replaced her senior press secretary, naming her special cultural advisor Kim Sung-woo. President Bak, who named four honorary advisors last month to improve external communication, also announced three political advisors. Chu Oyoung, Yoon sang yeon and Kim Jae-won are all experienced ruling party lawmakers and are close to the president. Interesting to note, the president added former opposition lawmaker Kim kyung jae who crossed party lines to assist President Park in 2013 as her second press relations advisor. Having completed the personnel reshuffle and with many of her confidence by her side, President Park looks set to push ahead with her economic and reform policies this year, the third year of her presidency. Choi yoo Sun, Arirang News. Now, in the last of our three-part series on the president's performance so far and what's ahead in her third year in office, today we're going to focus on foreign policy. Korea is enjoying improved ties with China, but uh, has made little progress in terms of inter-Korean relations. Our foreign affairs correspondent Hwang Sung-hee tells us more. A stronger alliance with the United States and a budding friendship with China are two of President Park Geun-hye's most notable diplomatic achievements. The signing of a free trade agreement deepened Seoul's economic cooperation with Beijing, and the two neighbors have opened up military channels. But experts say South Korea may find itself in a difficult position between the two great powers. And I would say right now, uh, the missile defense issue and the question of that deployment in South Korea is one place where you can watch this tension really bubbling right up to the surface. Despite President Park's pledge to improve inter-Korean ties, tensions remain high. Some blame her lack of flexibility for fizzled momentum, like last year's reunions for war-separated families and a surprise visit to the South by a high-level North Korean delegation. Even the unification minister recently admitted that the Park administration's signature trust politique, which focuses on building trust with the North through dialogue and cooperation, failed to make any significant progress. But there are doubts that a fresh approach will be any better as long as Pyongyang maintains its belligerence. She can try some things to elicit that reciprocity from the North, but until they have a more cooperative attitude, it's very difficult to achieve positive outcomes. Mm -hmm. Another task is getting Japan to fully acknowledge its wartime sexual enslavement of Korean women. 
with relations with Tokyo at their worst. Experts say Seoul should seek practical cooperation in areas like security and the economy. Since foreign affairs is an area that requires policies with a long-term perspective, experts say it's too early to judge whether the Park administration's diplomacy has been a success or a failure. Pang Sang-hee, Arirang News. A top U.S. intelligence official says a cyber attacks from foreign countries, including North Korea, are the biggest security threat America faces. He warns, along with Iran's hackings, Pyongyang's cyber threats can be more disruptive than others. Our Kim Min-ji with more. The United States faces a range of threats with cyber highest on the list. In testimony to a congressional committee outlining the intelligence community's assessment of global threats to the U.S., James Clapper, the director of national intelligence, said a number of nations stand as cyber threats to the U.S. Cyber poses a very complex set of threats because profit-motivated criminals, ideologically motivated hackers or extremists, and variously capable nation-states like Russia, China, North Korea, and Iran are all potential adversaries who, if they choose, can do great harm. Clapper noted that Russia in particular possesses sophisticated cyber capabilities more severe than previously assessed. Although North Korea and Iran have lesser technical capabilities, he said Pyongyang's alleged hacking of Sony Pictures and Iran's cyber attack on the Las Vegas Sands Corporation demonstrate that these nations are motivated and unpredictable cyber actors. In a report to Congress, Clapper said the North Korea's nuclear program also poses a serious threat to the security environment in the U.S. and East Asia. He said that the North is committed to developing a long-range nuclear-armed missile capable of hitting the United States. The intelligence chief added that the North has expanded its Yongbyon enrichment facility and restarted the reactor, in line with its stated intent to refurbish and restart its nuclear facilities. Kim min Arirang News. The National Assembly held its third and final day of questioning on the Park Geun-hye administration's policies, with lawmakers grilling officials this time on social policy. Lawmakers urged the government to come up with measures for pressing social issues such as child abuse and welfare system. Park ji tells us more. Lawmakers examined the government's social and educational policies on the last day of a three-day interpolation session at the National Assembly. Questions about policies for preventing child abuse at daycare centers topped the agenda following a recent series of child abuse cases at daycare centers that shocked the nation. The government came up with diverse measures to address the problem, such as making CCTV cameras at daycare centers compulsory. But lawmakers think that's not enough. Do you think tightening regulations could be a fundamental solution to the problem? I think a two-tiered approach is necessary. First, regulation should be tightened to prevent any more cases of abuse from reoccurring, as child abuse is an absolute crime. But that's not enough. We will come up with other measures to improve the treatment of daycare teachers and the daycare environment. The nation's welfare system was also on the agenda and hotly debated at the session. Lawmakers pointed out the administration has failed to carry out its pledge to expand welfare without raising taxes. Tell us the underlying principle for the administration and the ruling party's welfare plan. As the nation's deputy prime minister, I vow that the government will pursue both goals of expanding the welfare system and securing the necessary funds to support it, based on the administration's previous pledges and a realistic evaluation of the current economic situation. Lawmakers also questioned the government on its plans for strengthening the nation's crisis management and safety systems, as well as devising ways of protecting non-permanent employees. Park Ji-won, Arirang News. Another shooting incident in a city south of Seoul. This time, the gunman in his 70s shot his older brother and brother's wife. 
and a police officer at the scene before taking his own life. The gunman had reportedly made threats over financial issues before today's attack. The dead couple's daughter-in-law reportedly told police that the gunman had harassed the couple in the past, asking for money whenever he got drunk. An investigation into the case is still underway. Now, in the wake of this uh, shooting incident, the second this week alone, we take a look at what caused these gunmen in these cases to open fire and whether new police measures on gun control will be enough to prevent a copycat crime. Connie Kim tells us more. A gunman fatally shoots his brother, sister-in-law, and a responding police officer before turning the gun on himself. Friday's shooting has left the country reeling in shock. It closely follows another shooting this week where an armed man killed three people in a violent attack against his former lover's family. What's alarming is that the assailants in both these cases targeted people who were close to them, which brings into question their underlying motivation. When people's needs or wants are not realized or achieved, anger is likely to build up within them and it could be let out in a very violent way. Korea has rapidly become a capitalist society with people wanting more but are unable to control their anger at the same time. To prevent another such shooting from happening, police are pushing to tighten gun ownership regulations. Individuals with a history of violence will be prohibited from owning guns, and gun license renewal periods will be cut to three years. However, some analysts doubt the new measures will be effective in preventing future incidents. Gun shootings like this happen when people cannot control their emotions. It is hard to predict whether or not a gun buyer will potentially turn violent. Experts say the new set of regulations may temporarily ring alarm bells, sending a message that trying to get a gun won't be so easy. But they say what's more important are fundamental measures, such as providing easier access to personal counseling, in order to prevent a third or fourth copycat shooting from occurring. Connie Kim, Arirang News. Tech reporters and enthusiasts from around the world will soon gather in Barcelona for this year's Mobile World Congress, which kicks off on this Monday. Alongside a slew of other top technology brands, Korean tech giants Samsung and LG will be also unveiling the latest additions to their lineups. Our Song ji -sun gives us a preview. Samsung is aiming to capture the spotlight ahead of the Mobile World Congress opening on Monday in Barcelona. It's set to unveil two versions of its new Galaxy S6, the standard version and the S6 Edge, at a press conference on Sunday. The Edge is set to have a curved screen that covers two sides, a technology already applied to its Note Edge model on one side. It will likely feature a Quad HD Super AMOLED display, an upgrade from the S5 series, and a case made entirely of metal and glass, drawing comparisons to Apple's iPhone 6. The S6 is also expected to feature the new Samsung Pay system, following the company's acquisition of U.S. mobile technology firm Loop Pay, in a bid to make inroads into the mobile payment technology market. Unlike last year when it revealed its Samsung Gear smartwatch alongside the Galaxy S5, Samsung has no plans to introduce a new wearable device this year, so the focus is solely on its new smartphone. Samsung has been losing market share to Apple after the California-based firm launched its large-screen iPhone 6 models. Samsung's global smartphone market share is sagged to 25 percent last year, while Apple's share jumped to 38 percent. What's more, Chinese handset makers are quickly catching up to the market's number three player, LG. In Barcelona, LG Electronics is hoping to draw attention to its new wearable devices. Its new smartwatch is able to connect to a high-speed 4G wireless network, making it the world's first smartwatch equipped with LTE connectivity. The LTE version of the watch Urbane comes with a mobile payment system installed. The watch can also be submerged in a meter deep water for up to 30 minutes, and it has an extended battery life that allows it to last a few days on standby. Song Ji-sun, Arirang News. 
And although not necessarily at the MWC, there's another global tech giant seeking to release its wearable device. Apple has sent out invitations to a media event on March 9th, where it's expected to announce the highly anticipated details of its Apple Watch. Invitations to the surprise event may say simply spring forward. That phrase and the event's date hint at the official unveiling of the gadget as Americans will be turning their watches an hour forward for the start of daylight savings on March 8th. Korea's rapidly aging population is having a noticeable impact on the country's workforce as well. The latest figures show six out of ten employed in Korea are over 40 years old. And experts are warning that the domestic economy could soon find itself with a serious shortage of workers. Hwang Jie explains. Just over 44 years old. That was the average age of Korean workers last year. That's eight years older than 40 years ago when people in their 30s took up the largest portion of the workforce. The average age of workers reached 40 in 1999, and since then it has been on a steady increase. It's no wonder that people who are in the 55 to 64 age group added five times as many jobs than those in their 20s last year from 2013. Given the pace at which the country's population is aging, experts say Korea is likely to struggle in the near future with a lack of workers that will in turn hurt Korea's economic growth. The elderly population that's over the age of 65 will take up 40 percent of the total population less than 50 years, which means the country will drastically lose its dynamics while growth slumps. That will make it harder for the government to collect taxes as well. That, however, is just the beginning of the vicious cycle. A drop in Korea's tax revenue will lead to a deterioration of the country's fiscal health, they say, as welfare demands from the aging population pile up. And to tackle the issue, experts add that the government needs to push through plans to boost the employment rate for women. That is one of the lowest in the OECD. Hwang Jie, Arirang News. American and Cuban officials are holding a fresh round of talks in Washington as they embark on the next step in restoring diplomatic ties. And Paul Lee is joining us from the News Center to tell us more. Uh, Paul, this meeting comes after last month. Was it uh, historic negotiations in Havana? What's on the agenda for this Friday? Well, it's very much expected that both sides will continue that dialogue from January. The U.S. will likely call on Raul Castro to expand democratic freedoms for the island nation, while Cuba will push to have the country removed from the U.S. list as state sponsors of terrorism. Policy experts say the two sides will also discuss potential cooperation in areas such as maritime security, anti-drug enforcement, and banking. This as Cuba is showing signs of a major policy shift with a new generation of leaders. The president is thinking about his own legacy, which is two more years, but the Cubans have their own legacy in mind, and that involves kind of protecting the achievements they believe in of the revolution while also moving Cuba toward the 21st century and entering the global economy. And they know that they need to change. Many expect a third round of bilateral discussions to take place later in March. That's just weeks ahead of a summit in Panama in which both Cuban leader Raul Castro and U.S. President Obama will attend. Mm -hmm. Now, the identity of the Islamic State militant known as Jihadi John has been unveiled. His name, Mohammed Mwazi, a British national born in Kuwait and educated in London. Paul, from all reported indications, this young man appears to have had a well-settled life. What turned him to join this terrorist group? Well, according to Mwazi's friends cited by the Washington Post, he began to slip into a radical Islamist ideology in 2009 after being stopped by authorities on his way to Tanzania. Now, it's important to note that British officials have not yet publicly confirmed this man's identity, but he is widely believed to be the one appearing in a series of brutal IS videos depicting the execution of Western hostages. Our Yi has more details. 
The infamous Islamic State killer Jihadi Jah's real name is Mohammed Mwazi. The BBC and the Washington Post first broke the story on Thursday, citing former associates. Several other news outlets then reported that anonymous U.S. intelligence officials had confirmed that Jihadi John is indeed a Mwazi. The Kuwait-born British man in his mid-twenties comes from a middle-class family and attended college in London. He reportedly then went to Syria just three years ago to join the Islamic State group. Mwazi is the man seen in one brutal execution video after another in which he beheaded American journalist James Foley and Japanese journalist Kenji Goto. The BBC reports that U.S. and British authorities determined the identity of Jihadi John several months ago, but didn't make it public for security reasons. The British-based human rights group CAGE, which helps Muslim prisoners, says Amwazi was a kind and soft-spoken young man, but that he felt like he was often harassed by security officials simply because he was Muslim. Various reports also say British officials suspected that Abwazi was trying to join the Somali Islamist militant group Al-Shabaab, so they stopped him from moving to Kuwait in 2010. The White House says it's not able to confirm or deny the reports of the man's identity. British police also declined to comment, citing the ongoing investigations. Still, this new information is likely to heat up the fight against a terrorist group and how authorities will now go about their hunt for Abwazi. And turning back to the United States, activists and tech companies are hailing a landmark ruling by the country's communications regulator as a victory for an open and free Internet. At the center of this ongoing battle is net neutrality. Tell us, what exactly is this concept? Well, it's a term to describe what should be the fair rules that regulate web traffic around the world. But I think the FCC Commissioner Tom Wheeler said it best when he vowed that no one, whether government or corporate, should control the open access nature of the Internet. Wheeler was referring to a recent decision by the Federal Communication Commission to treat all Internet service providers as a utility, and that's just like phone companies. Analysts say it's a win for consumers and innovation in an industry that thrives on equality and freedom. Well, I have to point to, you know, Netflix as a potential winner here. This is what the company has been clamoring for all along, and not just Netflix, but a whole host of other um, kind of uh, online, you know, streaming providers. Um, you know, you can also look to, um, you know, other companies that are startups in the space. Uh, that otherwise might not have had a chance to even, you know, um, you know, compete. Critics say the strict regulations will discourage investment by big telecom firms. The new rules are also expected to be challenged by Internet broadband providers in court. And uh, finally, Paul, a fashion crime has been reported in Hollywood. And no, it's not Lady Gaga. Uh, sorry, Lady Gaga. And police in Los Angeles say a dress was stolen, but this isn't just any red carpet dress, is it? No, it isn't. It's a one-of-a-kind gown made by Calvin Klein, adorned with over 6,000 stunning pearls, valued at 150,000 U.S. dollars. However, the reason why this theft is making headlines is because it was stolen right under from an Oscar-winning actress. Lupita Nuno was staying at the London Hotel in West Hollywood when the priceless dress was taken from her room on Wednesday. She had worn the outfit when she presented at the Academy Awards ceremony this past Sunday. The West Hollywood Sheriff's Department said they were investigating the matter. Charity? We all remember this dress. It was a beautiful dress. Well, I hope uh, they find it uh, somehow. We'll leave it there. Thank you so much, Paul, and we will see you again in just about two hours. Hello and happy Friday. I'm Kim Bo Kyung with your weather outlook. We are wrapping up the last workday of the week under cloudy skies and brisk cold conditions. So at the moment, it's about 3.5 degrees here in the capital, but due to the wind chill factor, it feels more like minus two. So make sure to bundle up if you are headed outdoors. Now, as for tomorrow, rain clouds are set to move in, leading to a mix of snow and showers. This should first begin down in Teju before spreading to most parts of the country. Taking a closer look up to 8 centimeters
centimeters of snow is expected for both Gyeongsangdo provinces, and about a centimeter should fall here in Seoul. Meanwhile, as for the rainfall, Jeju may get about 40 millimeters, while about five is in store for the central regions. And looking ahead, the current cold snap should gradually ease up by tomorrow afternoon, and numbers will jump back to the seasonal norms over the weekend. On to tomorrow's readings. Seoul, Daegu, and Gwangju should hit 7, Busan reaches 8. Meanwhile, Jeju reaches up to 9, Dokdo hits 5, Mount Kumgang minus 1. Those are the updates we're following at this hour. Hope you have a wonderful Friday evening. I'll be back with more after 10. Thank you very much, Po Gang, and that does it for this edition of Arirang News. Thanks for watching.